Hi everybody, uh, thanks for tuning in. This is the third lecture of the Controls Classroom, so let's dive right into the notes. Uh, so I think everybody has been uh, really ramping up well with uh, Ubuntu. Uh, I'm definitely proud of the progress made so far with the first reading and quiz, so please keep up the good work. I'm going to be sending individual feedback uh, about the homework soon. I think I'll just be sending it over direct message going over which uh, questions uh, were just correct or which uh, might have been better with a different answer. Um, I am willing to change the format to maybe something where I just review the solutions from the previous lecture at the beginning of each lecture the following week. If you think that would be a better format, uh, please post your opinion in controls and I'll definitely take it into consideration. So let's talk about users and groups. Uh, the operating system, uh, Ubuntu, is designed for multiple users. So you can have multi multiple people logged in at the same time. They all have their own set of files. Um, and users can be members of groups. So your uh, role as a user and what groups you're in control which files uh, you can mess with on the computer and which hardware you can use on the computer. So for an example of that on Windows, you can think of the administrators group uh, where you need to be an administrator to install a program for the whole computer. It's just like that. So there are a lot of groups on Ubuntu. You don't need to worry about all of them. If you want to look at the groups that your account is in, just run the groups command and it'll output a list of those groups. Um, so I just said that your user uh, and the groups that you're in kind of influence what files you can access on the computer. And this is enforced through something called file system permissions. So what prevents me from peeking at another user's files? Uh, maybe they have like sensitive documents or something in their home directory. What's to stop me from just coming in and looking at it? And to answer that, we need to understand that every file and directory on the computer is associated with a user and one single group. And there are three file system permissions. There's three types of permissions. The permission to read a file or read uh, list the contents of a directory the permission to write a, to a file or add or remove files in a directory. And writing a file just means like editing a file. And then there's the execute permission, where for a file, if you have the execute permission, you can run it as if it's a program. Or for a directory, if you have the execute permission, you can change your PWD to that directory. And these are binary on off. Um, there's three sets of them. So there's a set of read, write, execute for the user. There's a set of read, write, execute for uh, group members for the group that owns the file. And there's a set of read, write, execute for everyone else, um, everybody besides the user and the group members. And so uh, I say they're evaluated in the above order. That's actually not correct. Um, if you have a permission, uh, if you have the read permission for any of these sets, for example, you may not be the owning user, um, but you are part of everybody else and the everybody else set has read permission, then you have read permission. Or maybe you're a group member uh, and you're also the user, and the user has write permission, but the group member doesn't have write permission, like this group set doesn't, but the user set does. If any of those sets have the permission, then you have the permission. So in that case, you would be able to write to that file. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, so this side will make a little more sense after I go into the terminal. And I'm gonna start by making a directory just called foo. And if I do ls-l now on the current directory, you can see a few things. Uh, you can see that foo is here, it's got this funky set of characters here, and it's got my username twice. And so this column here with my username 
says that I am the user that owns the file. C Worley is the user that owns the file. Now this column is saying that C Worley is the group that owns the file. Um, this could be uh, any group really. Um, on Ubuntu, groups are made corresponding to new users, but you could imagine this could be the administrator's group. And I can actually uh, change that right now. Uh, you don't need to worry about what this command is doing. It's just changing the group. And now you can see um, C. Worley is the user that owns the file, and ADM, which is short for admin, is the group that owns the file. So when we talk about group permissions, we're talking about permissions for anybody that's a member of the ADM group on this computer in particular. And so what's this funky string? Like D WRX WRX, or sorry, D RWX RWX RWX. If we go back to the slides and sort of break it down, the D just means that we're looking at a directory. So we don't really care about that part. Um, it's just a helper to tell us what it is. RWX, the first one, tells us that the user has read, write, and execute permissions. And the second one tells us that the group, members of the ADM group, have those same permissions. And the final one tells us that everybody else has those same permissions as well. So as an example, um, let's say we saw like dash rwx r dash x dash dash dash. How do we break this down when we see this? Well, the first dash means that it's a regular file. It's not a directory or something special like uh, a link that we'll learn about in this reading. The first RWX means that the user can read, write, and execute. The second set, R-X, means that members of the group, um, in this case, for this foo directory, ADM, they can read and execute, but they can't write. So they can kind of peek into the directory, but they can't put anything in it or take anything out of it. And then the final dash 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 means that everybody else has no permissions. They can't look in the directory, they can't change into the directory, they can't add or remove files from it, they can't do anything. So how do you set permissions on a file or directory? Um, we get permissions when we create them, but what if we want to change them from the defaults? Well, uh, you use this command called uh, chmod. It's short for change mode. So how do you use change mode? Well, to do it, you need to think about permissions as zeros or ones. So um, if we don't let the user write to a file, you can think of the user's write permission as being a zero in binary. Otherwise, it would be a one. And so hopefully this table isn't too intimidating. If we look at the example from the last slide where we had rwx r-x dash dash dash, we can kind of break this down. We want the user to have every permission. So the user's got one for read, one for write, one for execute. For the group, we want them to have read and execute, but we don't want them to have write. So they've got a one here for read and a one here for execute, but they have a zero here for write. Then for everybody else, we're just going to give them zeros across the board. So they've got all zeros here. So once we kind of have those ones and zeros written in, we want to take all the reads and multiply them by four, take all the writes and multiply them by two, and all the executes and multiply them by one. And then when we go down this column uh, for user, well, we've got four here, two here, one here. We're gonna add four plus two plus one equals seven. For the group permissions, we've got four, zero, one. So four plus zero plus one is five. And then for everybody else, we've got zero, zero, zero. So we get a zero here. And the command we actually run uh, to change these permissions is change mode 750, so 7 for the user, 5 for the group, and 0 for everybody else, and then the target, the file of the directory that we want to change permissions on. So if I go back to the terminal here and I make a file called, um, I don't know, let's call it holy cow, that's easy, and we 
do LSL again, we can see holy cow came in with these default permissions. But if we do change mode 750 holy cow, and then we look in the directory again, you can see that holy cow now has those permissions we just described, where first three letters are WX, the user can do everything. Next three letters are dash X, the group can read and execute, but it can't write. And then finally, dash, 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 everybody else can't do anything if they're not the user or in the group. And so the first question is probably, is there an easier way to do this? This is like kind of a pain to compute the numbers every time. And yeah, we can use letters instead of numbers. So I'm going to go back to the terminal here and I'm going to reset the permissions on holy cow and 777 this is going to give permissions to everybody and you can see full read write and execute for everyone one way we can get back into this state without having to do this numbers business is we can do change mode and we can say user equals so u for user and then the equal sign and we can put in the permissions we want the user to have. So we want the user to have RWX. Read, write, and execute. And then comma, G equals, and these are the permissions that group members should have. And so we only want RX, no, uh, no write permission here. And then finally, for uh, everybody else, O, short for others, we're just gonna put equals nothing. And then we're gonna put that on holy cow and run that command. And if we look in the directory again, you can see that we're back to where we were before. It's exactly the same. The other easy way to do this is to use a change mode calculator website. Just Google change mode calculator and you'll find something like this where you can check the boxes and it spits out the number for you. So in this case, if you put in read, write, execute for the user and just read, execute for the group, and nothing for everybody else, you'll get 750, just like we did on the previous slide. So permissions are not inherited. And I'd like to kind of demonstrate what that means. So let's make a directory called uh, safe to store some valuables in. And in fact, let's make a directory inside the safe called not so safe. Um, and let's say that we want to take away write permissions uh, for the safe from everybody. So if we just do change mode minus W, this minus sign means to take away and the W means the write permission. So we're gonna take away the right permission. And since we didn't put U, G, or O, it's just gonna take it away from everybody. So we're removing the right permission on the safe from everybody. And if we look at it again, you can see there's no W's here on the safe. And if we want to put something bad inside the safe, it's gonna say permission denied because we don't have write permissions. However, permissions are not inherited in directories. So if we go in the safe and then we go in this not so safe directory and we wanna put a bad file there, that's completely fine because we still have write permissions on the inner file. If you do this in the safe directory, you can see that we totally have these W's for write on not so safe. And just to prove that it's there, you can see that bad file has been created inside. So that's what I mean when I say uh, permissions are not inherited. Just because a parent directory doesn't have a permission, uh, an inner directory or a child directory could have that permission. However, permissions can stop path resolution. So for example, uh, if a directory doesn't have execute permissions, then you actually can't do anything 
inside of that directory. Um, no matter how far down the chain you go, and if you think back to the uh, previous lecture where we were looking at how files are organized, if you uh, start at the root here and then go to home and then go to C Worley, if you don't have permission to uh, go to the home directory, or like execute and change your PWD to the home directory, then it's going to stop there. You can't go into the C Worley directory below it. Um, and so to demonstrate that, if we go to the terminal here, I will uh, restore my write permissions on the safe directory. But one thing I'm going to do is take away the execute permissions on the safe directory. And now uh, I can still read it. I can look inside the safe directory and see that there's a not so safe inside of it. However, it's saying that we can't access not so safe anymore. And that's kind of weird. Uh, if we look at safe, not so safe, we get permission denied. And the reason why is because when Linux or Ubuntu is looking at these paths, it's going to try to change the PWD into safe, and then it's going to look for something inside called not so safe. Uh, however, when you can't change the PWD anymore because you don't have the execute permission, then that's as far as you'll be able to go. You'll be able to peek inside the safe and see the contents because you still have the read permission, but you can't go any further down the tree because you don't have the execute permission. And so just to prove that point, I'm going to restore execute permissions on the safe and I'm going to take away read permissions. So now I can try to look in the safe again and oh we get permission denied trying to look at it. However, we can actually look inside the not so safe and see that bad file is still there. And so this is because when Linux is looking at the paths uh, it doesn't care if it can read the directories or not, it only cares if it can change into them. And so it'll try to change into safe using the execute permission, and then it'll look for not so safe. And I can actually change into safe myself. If I try to look around, I get an error, uh, but it is allowed. So I'll just restore the read permission on the safe real quick. So let's think about administrator privileges. Um, if you need to install a new program or mess with system files, or you need to fix broken permissions on a file, like you somehow got it into a state where uh, you removed your own permissions from it and you don't want to add them back manually, um, then you need administrator privileges. So to give an example of that, um, Let's say I have a file called whoops, and I accidentally removed my write permissions on whoops. So you can see all I can do is read it. Um, you can actually add the permissions back because you own the file, you're the owner. Um, however, Let's say that uh, you have a ton of files that are like this and you can't be bothered to fix all of them. Um, and for the sake of demonstration, you really just want to delete this file in a sledgehammery way. Um, the answer is a command called sudo, which is short for super user do. And this is like a big sledgehammer command. So don't use it if you don't have to. And I'm going to demonstrate how it works real quick and how it's going to look for you guys. Um, I'm trying to delete this whoops here. And uh, I mean, you can actually delete it here. Um, but if uh, somebody else owns it, like let's say uh, 
if you look at the files in user local bin, or maybe just user bin since we haven't installed anything yet. Come on, Ubuntu. These are all owned by root. And maybe you got something in here that you didn't intend to install and you're having trouble getting rid of it. And you're not going to be able to delete these files um, because they're owned by root and not you. And if you look at everybody else's permission, you don't have the right permission. That's an example. Um, another example for the sake of argument is uh, we have this whoops file. We change its mode to remove the right permission. And when we see this, we don't want to just press Y here and say yes. We want to really delete this file uh, with no regard for uh, its permissions. Then what we want to do is use the sudo command. And so the way you do it is just write sudo and then the command as you would have written it otherwise. And it's going to ask for your password. You type in your password and press enter. And let me get my password right this time. And it will delete this file. No complaints, no warning about the file being write protected. It's just going to get rid of it. And you can see that it is totally gone. Yep. So you don't want to use this command unless you really have to. Like in that example with the terminal, if it's just saying, do you really want to remove this write protected empty file? Just say yes. Um, don't break out sudo. It offers no protection from deleting like a necessary system file that will break your system if you don't have. It'll just delete it because you told it to delete it. Um, so be extremely careful about combining sudo with things like rm. For example, if you did sudo rm dash rf slash, what would this do? And don't try it at home. Just think about it. Uh, you can pause the video for a second to think. And so what it would do is it will delete every file on your computer starting from the root. Um, so you really want to be careful about this. And so here's this like comic that's like, make me a sandwich. And it's like, no, you make it yourself. And you say, sudo make me a sandwich. And the computer has no choice but to uh, obey the command. So that covers uh, everything I wanted to say about permissions. I know that was a bit uh, heavy. Um, and so I would be totally open to answering any questions you have over Slack. So definitely post them. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is input, output, redirection, and pipes. So commands can take an input uh, and they can produce output. And so we've seen output before. Uh, for example, if I say, who am I, uh, the output is cworldly. It's what it says in response to the command. But what is an input? And so for an example, we can look at the sort command. Um, so if I say sort, it doesn't do anything. It puts me into this weird thing I can't get out of. Um, and so you need to understand that when it's in this mode, it's waiting for you to give it input. And so I can give it input one line at a time. For example, I could say the, and then press enter to make a new line, holy, and then make another new line and then cows, and then I can make a few more new lines. Um, and the way you tell the command that you're done giving it input is you press Control D. And when you press Control D, you can see that it gave us a bunch of output. It gave us the inputs sorted into alphabetical order. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And so we can type in input and we can visually inspect the output just like we did in the terminal where we typed in the holy cows and we got cows holy the as the output. But we can also supply input from files. So for example, um, 
I can go into nano and uh, I'll make a file called numbers.txt. And I can say 1538, like our team number. And I'll save that as a file, save it as numbers.txt. And if we want to supply this as input, um, we can do sort, and we'll do sort-n for numbers, uh, which is just like a peculiarity of the sort program. And then we do this less than sign. Um, and this less than sign says that a file is going to come after this, and we're going to use that file to supply the input to the command. Instead of having to type it ourselves, we're going to use the contents of the file. So if I do that on numbers.txt, you can see that I get a blank line, because I put a blank line in the file, and then we get 1, 3, 5, 8. So these are sort of sorted in ascending order. Um, going back to the slides, we can also put output into files. So in the terminal, if I press the up arrow to bring that command back up, I can do this uh, greater than sign. And this greater than sign kind of has a similar meaning. It means that we're going to put the name of a file after it. And instead of putting the output of the command onto the screen, just put it into this file. So if I run this, we're not going to see any output, and we didn't have to type any input. But if we look at the sorted.txt that we sort of said the output would go into, we're going to see that it's got the output of the command. Um, so let's go back to the sides. We can also connect the output of one command to the input of another command. So this is where things get pretty, uh, pretty cool. You can do some neat stuff. So I'm going to do a demo where we uh, are going to download like the complete works of Shakespeare and find like the top 10 most common words used just by chaining these simple Unix commands together. So um, I did this earlier, and there's this command you can use to download uh, complete works of Shakespeare. I will have that command in the sides when I post this. And so I'm going to run that. And it did this thing. And if we look in the current directory now, you can see we have this t8.shakespeare.txt file. And so the first thing I need to do is break up words to be on individual lines. So there's a command called tr, which can take uh, char it's basically a find and replace for characters. So I'm going to tell it to find spaces, and I'm going to tell it to re replace those spaces with new lines. Um, that's what this backslash n represents. And I'm going to provide the Shakespeare file as input. So now, um, if I run this, I can use this vertical uh, bar it's like uppercase, like shift backslash on most keyboards. And this is saying take the output of the previous command and plug it into the input of the next command. And so I'm going to plug it into head n5. And what this head command does is it's going to look at the first 10 lines that come in through the pipe as input. And so if I run that, you'll see that this is uh, it's breaking up each of the words that were in the input file onto uh, separate lines. Um, so I'm going to keep plugging things in. And uh, there's a program that we can use called unique. Um, and if we do unique-c, that's going to uh, count the number of occurrences of each word. Uh, the issue with unique is that the input needs to be sorted. So we're just going to sort it first. And if I plug that into the head command again, you can see that it's now blank lines because um, we didn't strip out blank lines from the input. 
um, if we change head to tail to look at the last 10 lines from the sort command, you'll see a lot of things with Z's. Um, and that makes sense. If we sort this alphabetically, we expect Z's to be at the end. So now that it's sorted, let's look at uh, these uniques. And let's look at the head again. And you can see that we have a lot of blank lines. We have uh, a lot of things starting with A. Um, and if you look at more lines of output of unique, you can see that uh, it's putting this counter before each word. And so if we sort these lines numerically, uh, it's going to look at these numbers and sort them. So we just keep chaining the output and sort numerically. And let's look at the head again. Um, and so this is in ascending order. So if we want to see the most common words, we want to look at the tail. And you can see the most common word is like a blank line. Um, so we can ignore that. However, after that, you can see that like the number one actual word is the, and then I, and then and, to, of, and so on. Um, and if we want to look at more output, we can look at, say, 50 lines. And so this is kind of like the power you can get just by chaining these really simple commands together. Um, individually, they are not doing that much, right? We're just doing a find and replace here. We're sorting alphabetically here. We're counting unique words here. And then we're sorting numerically here. And then we're looking at the top 50. Uh, individually, these commands aren't doing much. But when you chain them together, you can get a really cool result. Um, and I think that's why it's super useful to learn these, because um, it's going to save you time and effort when you want to do stuff with your computer. So here's the command to download Shakespeare, and you can just copy and paste this into your terminal. Uh, so final thoughts for today. Uh, I'd like people to read uh, chapters 4 through 6 of Unix Mages this week. Uh, the advanced sections are optional, but I'd really recommend doing them. Um, can't hurt to have more knowledge. And uh, if anybody has feedback for me or about the pacing of the course or really anything that could help you learn better, I would be happy to hear it. Uh, feel free to post that in the controls channel. And uh, yeah, just try to stay safe and stay inside with uh, the quarantine continuing. I know it's rough, but uh, hopefully it's over soon. All right, bye.